All right, everybody, welcome to the Wednesday live stream. We got a lot of things to go over, so let's just jump right in and get into it. So just like the thumbnail and title suggests, really it comes down to where you're at in the cycle. And of course, some people will say that the four-year cycles are defunct and they don't work, but uh, I'm still a believer in them because uh, so far it's been 13 years or so and uh, they still hold up. So right now, I still believe that we are in the little bit of a, of a dip before we get into our having. And just so everybody knows, my buddy uh, Tom Crown just pointed this out to me today that uh, the having is supposed to be on 420. Who'd have thunk it? So it is coming up fast. It's coming up quick. And that's really just where we're at. So when we take a look at this, I just made this little quick little graphic, not to say that this will be perfectly in alignment because nothing actually works perfectly. But so far, it's been the same thing over and over again. You get a having, then you get an all-time high, then a dip and a reset. Happened 2016, 2019. 2020, we had a halving, all-time high in 2021. It also looked like a double top. Then 2022, we took a big, massive hit and got kicked in the teeth. And from the tip top of where we were at, I think it was November 11th, 2020, 2021, to the bottom, which was again in November, uh, one year later, 2022, it, take, it took exactly, exactly one year. Then 2023, we get a reset, which we just lived through. And now 2024, we're going on the upward incline. And of course, just like Tom said, 420 is coming around pretty quick. And we have the halving, and then we jump in. So that is just taking a look at it. But as everybody as a, as a reminder, and I, I know that there are some people that have been here since 2012, 2013, and some of you have been here since 2021. And for those people, I want to say thanks for sticking around. He did a pretty hard thing to do, which was you know essentially get beat up. And you stuck around and you listened to some people and maybe you bought some dips here and there and you're like, you know what, I'm ready to roll. And for those people, congratulations. But I have to remind everybody about this, that usually when we go into halvings, it's a little bit of volatility. So I want to, I want to take a look at two data points uh, because in all honesty, we really haven't had numerous data points to really plot a ton of information. First, uh, having that in 2012, what I want to look at is 2016 and 2020. And the exact dates for the having of 2016 was July 9th, 2016. And I want you to notice something that just like we had the ETF, remember the ETF that came out, everybody thought it was going to be the most fantastic thing of all time. Well, it wasn't. Uh, it could still potentially be. I'm not going to, you know, talk negatively about it. I think it's doing quite well. However, it was a real buy the rumor, sell the news. And that's essentially what it is. Now, on this case, we're going to see the same thing. On July 9th, 2016, you will have, you get April, April, April. You, you buy the rumor as it's, actually, it's not a really a rumor. It's going to happen anyhow. But people are going to tell you like, this is it. You got to get in. You got to put everything in. And you can do that. I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm not a financial advisor. But just know that usually what happens is the price starts to spike and then it drops off as we go into like the actual having itself. Then it kind of tapers off and it gets boring. It gets very boring, actually. And you're going to take a look at this and be like, what did I sign up for? Why am I even here? You know, it's because essentially the having is the catalyst to kick us off to when we get into the bigger numbers going into 2024 towards the end of 2025. So that's just the first for piece. Let's take a look at May 11, 2020. And again, we can kind of see this thing kind of rolling out and doing the exact same thing. So we come over here. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. Same thing. Things start to do pretty well. People are all excited about the having. It's going to happen, baby. We're going to, it's going to be the best thing of all time and moon boots and everything else. And then pfft, down it goes. Now, this was a little bit different case because if you remember around March 2020 ish, what was the big event that happened? Surveys of sickness. Exactly. So it was a little bit skewed and people went down, but I still think that uh, we would still have a big, uh, a big drop off as we head into the having, which was again until May, and then it went sideways forever and people were bored and that's just how it's gonna happen, I believe again. Now, not to say this is gonna keep happening again and again and again, but it's like we're kind of lining up to the same thing happening. And I, for one, kind of feel like we're in the right place at the right time. However, talking about all that, this time will be different and I can guarantee it. And the reason why I can guarantee it is because there's these things called ordinals. And this is a great piece that was put out by Bitcoin Magazine. And it said the Bitcoin having why this time could be different, but it really is. I'm going to skip all this stuff because it's boring. Let me see the good stuff. Ordinals. If you're a Bitcoin maxi, you love them or hate them. Most of you guys hate them. 
That's just what it is. But I got to tell you, if you're a Bitcoin uh, miner, you're loving ordinals because the actual transaction fees are through the roof. Congratulations. You've surpassed the Ethereum gas fees. I didn't think that could actually happen. Anyhow, here's what it is. Ordinals. Of course, that is the, the process as you can inscribe and you can embed different applications or GIFs, images, text onto the, the Bitcoin blockchain and it stays hopefully forever. So ordinals, there's this thing called a rarity value to specific Satoshis or specific sats. I didn't know this. Each block has a coin base, thus producing an ordinal. Does anybody know what a uh, coin base is? Besides a centralized exchange that usually fails us during the peak of the bull runs? Just kidding. Coinbase, on the Bitcoin blockchain, all transactions executed on chain are combined to form one block. When a block is formed, it will be immediately added to the blockchain. Each block should contain one or more transactions, the first of which is also called a Coinbase transaction. So every 10 minutes when they produce a block, that's your Coinbase transaction. Interesting, the things that we forget going forward. So next piece. Each normal block produce, produces an uncommon sat or an uncommon Satoshi. The first block of each difficulty adjustment produces a rare sat. So you know that over time, as the Bitcoin miners, I'm not a Bitcoin miner, this is what they tell me, that over time there is a difficulty adjustment, depending on how much hash rate is actually going on, depending on how much actually mining processing power is happening, there is a difficulty rate. I know some people say, well, Rob, you don't understand because the Bitcoin's gonna go out of business. Some are, that's just how it is. But when they do go out of business, and this actually will happen, I believe in the Bitcoin having, like it always does, they're gonna shut off those mining rings because it's the same amount of power for half of the amount of the rewards. So this is gonna happen, the difficulty adjustment will adjust down, then the miners that actually can make it, and that's the why they're selling off right now, so they can make it later. Then they're gonna be the ones that are gonna be the big winners. So when that happens, there's this thing called a rare set. And the first block of each halving cycle produces an epic set. I had no idea that was a thing. The first block of each halving cycle produces an epic set. You know what's gonna happen? April 20th. Imagine that somebody inscribing on that set for that ordinal. How much do you think that would be worth? A dollar? $20, $1 million, who knows? That's where I think it's gonna get interesting. This halving will be the first one since the widespread adoption of ordinal theory. There has never been the production of an epic sat while there was material market demand for it. The fact that a large market segment of the Bitcoin space would value that single coin base drastically higher than any other creates an incentive for miners to fight over. And it talks about reorganizing blocks. I'm not gonna get into it, it's very, it's kind of droll. But this is one of those instances where that ordinal, I personally believe it's gonna be worth a lot of money, but we'll see how it all works out. But this is definitely gonna be different and that's where we come from. So let me just think about that in the comment section. And then also I, uh, I need to do a, a video on how to do an ordinal inscription. If you'd like to see that, uh, put that, that comment in the section or a, a sec uh, comment down below and I'll make a video about how to actually inscribe in ordinals and I'll use all that stuff, but I won't do it unless somebody, or if you guys actually wanna see it, cause some of you really couldn't care. So there is that piece. Now moving into what I call the Goldilocks zone, because right now we talk about the halving and all that stuff, but around the halving is when fireworks happen. And this was actually shared with me by Lydia Crypto. And I had not, wasn't aware of this, but it's very true. This Goldilocks zone is when we, have halvings. And around that time is when if you're a smart project, you know that this is around the time when things start to take off. You're not going to launch a bunch of projects in the bear market when no one wants to do anything and they're, they're out, of the, out of the system. What you want to do is you want to wait around this time when there's a plethora of liquidity or more liquidity coming into the sector. And that's when you can actually maximize your potential. And that's when we're gonna see a lot of projects come in and start up, they're gonna be monsters. So on this one, I like this one, Matic, April, 2019, that did okay. Axie, which we're gonna talk about a little bit. Solana, April, 2020. Sand, August, 2020. Shiba Inu, August, 2020. AVAX, we're gonna talk about that as well, September, 2020. Gala, August, 2020. All this happened around this Goldilocks time frame, And you will notice I did not mention one thing, and I will, Luna. 
Luna also launched around this time and it was a massive hit, but it's your job as an investor to figure out which one of these are gonna be the grand be all everything and the ones that are gonna collapse. Now I can't tell you what that is, but I can tell you for me personally, that's why I diversify. So talking about that, Avalanche and AVAX, this was a piece that I pulled. This just happened six hours ago. And uh, actually it was, a, it was a video that was posted by the Avalanche team. And this is here from the uh, Salt uh, Salt Connections, their different, uh, uh, what is this, the meeting that they had for different powers or titans of industry, I guess, in the, in the blockchain sector. And this is John Nahas. And uh, you can follow him here, link in the description. He's a senior, senior vice president at Ava Labs. Anybody who... Uh, <laughs> has a mullet for their profile picture, can't be all bad. Just listen to what he says, because I think it's it's kind of striking about what people believe uh, about the blockchains and the ones that are actually gonna win. Let me uh, pull this up so you can hear it perfectly. I want you to actually understand what he's saying. Take a listen to this, it's at 45 seconds or so. With people building in blockchain crypto, I think the biggest misconception is that there will be a single chain that will win out, right? Or a single chain can be used for all of the digitization and, and transfer of value across numerous different kinds of asset classes. Previous year cycles, we proved out the main chain thesis. That was our crawl. We launched subnets. That was our walk. And now we're going to be start to connect a lot of these subnets together. And that's going to be our run moment where you start to see traditional finance applications, enterprises, gaming, and all these different innovative applications on their own sovereign chains have connection and see that value transfer and really start to see the next stages of what blockchain can. Yeah, well, we'll see. So like with that one, it makes a lot of sense of what he's talking about. And if you're unaware, Avalanche actually partnered up with JP Morgan to do their cross-train transactions for RWAs or real world assets. So when he's talking about these things about, you know, it's not just going to be one winner of a blockchain. I happen to believe that. Look, I'm old. And uh, that's not surprise anybody. But when, when I was coming up, when we heard about the internet, we thought it was, I swear to God, we thought that there would be one, it'd be one website for everything. And that would do it. Maybe like a couple, maybe that was about it. And then of course, when social media came about, we're like, you know what? How many do we really need? I mean, just one would probably be good, pretty good. Friendster looks like it's going to be awesome. <laughs> and then, of course, here we are, and we have like tons of them. So I know when some people will say, no, 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 we're only going to have one. There's going to be one blockchain and one winner, and that's pretty much it. I understand the thesis. I get it. Of course, we're talking about everything that, as, as far as like the execution layer for the internet. Sure, but I still think there's going to be more winners than just one, but I could be wrong. So having being playing on that theme itself, I thought it was interesting about what AVAC is actually doing. So they are really heavily into, of course, he talked about subnets, but gaming. And gaming, I know this is one of the things that I talk about on the channel for quite some time, because I think that the next narrative is gonna be three things. AI, as, as we all move to that, DEXs, decentralized exchanges, because the centralized exchanges really can't keep up, and the DEXs that we have right now are vastly an improvement over the originals. And the last one is Web3 Gaming. And one of the reasons is because there's a lot of opportunity there. And I know some people say, well, how much money is really, really available? Look, if you compare the movies to the revenue that's created in gaming, it's not even close. I mean, it's, all, it's over 180 billion. That's in 2021. I don't have updated uh, graphic for this one. But the movies, just in movies, 39 billion. And that was before the big slump off with the coronavirus in 2019. So they're wildly, vastly superior. And then the question then becomes, well, how many gamers are there? If you take a look at Statista, number of gamers in 2015 is 2 billion. And 2023, we had 3.22. Now we'll probably get 3.3 billion. That's a lot of people. How many people are on the planet? Like 8 billion, 7.8. Correct me in the comment section. But, uh, you know, roughly there's a lot of people who play games. And that could be a multitude of games. That could be, hyper casual, that could be the goofy games in your phone, or that could be the crazy games that are out there, like the esports people. And this was a post by Avalanche Gaming. And they said, hey, in case you didn't know, esports being pretty big. And then right here under Statista, it says the video game market is worth an estimated 385 billion. And esports players are increasingly contributing to that figure. They just signed a deal 
With TSM's The Blitz, The Blitz will host Avalanche branded tournaments and create myriad new ways for fans to interact with their favorite games all on their own dedicated chain. So there is that piece. And I got to tell you, we've come a long way in Web3 gaming as opposed to like this, which is what everybody makes fun of, Axie Infinity, although it has made a resurgence on the Ronin network. I'll, I'll, I'll give it that. I mean, these are kind of goofy. Let's just be honest. To games like this, and this is from Avalanche, AVAX Games, off the grid. Now, these are the games that, like two years ago, you didn't see this. And these are games that are actually available right now. You can play them. They're on PlayStation, Xbox, and PC. And then you got massive people like Dr. Disrespect, who I'm, I don't follow him, but I'm just saying, <laughs> obviously not. But he's a highly entertaining guy. And, uh, you know, four and a half million subscribers, big gamer. And then, of course, he's uh, one of those for off the grid. And then you got other games like Shrapnel. And uh, those are coming out hot and heavy and looks pretty good. And Shrapnel, like we talked about the Goldilocks zone, look at this. Shrapnel has only been out for like 30, 40 days. So if you're looking at things, you're like, it's not a bad idea. Even though it's that down 40% from its all-time high, these are the things you might want to start to look into like I am as maybe an opportunity for to diversify. But again, I can't tell you what to do. I'm not your dad. I'm not a financial advisor. However, I do got somebody who's a lot smarter than me. That's Ed Chang. I invited him on the show, and we did a quick interview about what they are doing behind the scenes, what's happening right now, and what's going to pop off in the future. So this is an eight minutes, roughly, interview. So I want to share this with you real quick, and uh, we will go from there. After this, we'll come back, and uh, we'll talk about, do a little quick little Q&A, and go from there. Let me see if I can pull up Ed. So Ed, thanks for coming on. Oh, you probably want to see it, huh? All right. Take a listen to this. Thanks for coming on for uh, the first time. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I know we've been talking about this for a while. Happy New Year! And Year. Uh, like I said, uh, excited to chat. Sweet. Okay. So everybody, so you may hear a a uh, screaming baby in the background. That is not the uh, stakeholders. That is. <laughs> That is just life. Future health. stakeholders, yeah, future, exactly. Future stakeholders, Ed. So, we'll, so we'll do this real quick. So, Ed, first of all, I got three questions for you. We'll go over those in detail. So, tell us about Avil Avax and what's been going on at this point. The second thing, what's you excited about as things are rolling out, and then what's beyond that? What's really going to happen in the next, you know, six months to a year or something like that? So, catch us up. Tell us what's going on about Avax and what's been gone to this point. Yeah, so Avalanche, we are a layer one protocol. Uh, you know, you probably um, know us for a variety of different reasons. So I, I obviously lead our gaming efforts and I've been here for just over two years, you know, but we um, are very prominent and prevalent in things like DeFi and NFTs and culture, as well as, you know, RWAs and institutional capital. So it's been uh, a lot of fun working here just because it's we're not just a gaming chain where we, we, we touch upon a lot of areas and you know the reasons why avalanche is very attractive is traditionally it's been known as an evm chain so obviously very you know um, solidity friendly but you know we've got a feature first of all we've got our, our novel avalanche consensus um, that allows for the fastest time to finality in crypto and you know it's probably pretty obvious why you know having sub second finality for your transactions and, and purchases on gaming makes a lot of sense but across the board you don't have to deal with reorgs. Like a lot, a lot of this stuff is just, just very intuitive, right? Um, the second kind of key differentiator is, you know, we've got um, a product called subnets, right? And so app chains are very hot right now, although we were probably, you know, the first to market with kind of mass adoption uh, for, for app chains. So what subnets allow you to do is effectively deploy your own, you know, private block space on top of our public chain, right? Mm -hmm. So if you think about, a monolithic chain like RC chain as a, as a freeway where there's different cars and there's different, you know, at a certain point, all these other dApps will congest that freeway, no matter how big like that freeway is, right? If you hit that scale. But what some that's allow you to do is basically have your own freeway and set your rules. So, you know, it's, it's very fast. You have low transaction speeds, oh, sorry, low transaction costs. Um, you know, uh, you can do things like set your custom, like your game token as the custom gas token instead of AVAX or ETH or something. So it can burn off supply. Um, you can designate custom validator sets, right? So that could be, um, you know, you can, you can choose investors or guilds to be your validators, but you can also tap into the over 1300, uh, validators in our ecosystem today. So, um, it could be permissionless. It can be permission. There's a lot of flexibility, right? And that makes a lot of sense and resonates. And you can see that. 
with the really cool uh, companies that we've announced, right? So we've got, you know, Deloitte, we announced kind of a POC with JP Morgan and other large banks, you know, SK, one of the largest companies in Korea is building on the subnet. We've got, you know, TSM and Blitz who are, who are deploying. We've got really cool games um, like Shrapnel and Godzilla and the Pegasi team. Um, you know, Merit Circle, the largest gaming DAO uh, in Web3 right now is deploying a subnet called Beam and publishing over 20 games. So um, it makes a lot of sense. Like, you know, once game teams and, and, and DAP teams understand like the value prop of Avalanche, and yeah. we're, we're, we're going bigger in the sense that we are known for EVM, but like we're actually VM agnostic, right? So uh, in, in the very near future, you'll be able to um, deploy and move or Rust or other languages within uh, within a subnet with our with our novel consensus. And so um, we're also building kind of the plumbing that allows you to seamlessly, you know, teleport and trans transport assets across different subnets seamlessly. Um, and once we can unlock that, I think that the, the, the sky's the limit there. That's crazy. That's a lot of stuff in a little bit of time. Ed, hey, perfect. I mean, that was really great. I mean, I, I've had a lot of people on the show, but very few people can actually uh, explicitly talk about what it is in, in such a, a quick fashion. So uh, we all appreciate it. So let's talk about the next piece. What are you excited about? Because you just gave us a whole handful of things, mm -hmm. but what do you, what's coming up that, like, like relatively soon that you're really excited about getting rolled out? Yeah, you know, uh, because I work in gaming, I'm going to start with that, right? Sure. I think... I think the the hard part about games are, and this is going to sound very obvious, is that they're very hard to build, right? They take a long time. And so whenever you're, you're working with really large development teams and these longer timelines and art and app store approvals and things like that, things tend to always take longer than you think they will, right? So we, we announced a lot of really cool projects last year. I think we'll start to see those those launch, you know, early this year. So we've got, you know, shrapnel and off the grid early access coming, right? Mm. Um, you know, Blitz is going to go online first with subscriptions uh, on their subnet and then a lot of really cool things in Q1 and Q2. You know, the a lot of Merit Circle games on, on that Beam subnet are going to come online, you know, mid this year. So um, those are some of the areas there, you know, stay tuned. We've got some other big gaming announcements coming up in, in the first half of this year. Um, we'll be out in full force at a couple conferences this year, including GDC. So really excited for those things to take off as well as, you know, our, our marketing team has been spending a lot of time kind of building our brand voice and, and kind of the vision and like relationships with influencers and the ecosystem. So we think that all that stuff is tied up really nicely. I think, um, you know, the work that one of my colleagues, Dom, has been doing on the NFT side has been great, too. We're really building out a narrative and an ecosystem on, on NFTs. And you're seeing some really cool mints. Um, and projects in that ecosystem, obviously, that's very adjacent to the stuff in gaming. So you'll see, you start to see a lot more crossovers there in terms of what we can tap into as well. That's crazy. Yeah, excellent. I didn't know. Yeah, Beam in the subnet. Fantastic. So, I mean, another thing to think about, but let's talk about what's beyond all that, because that's a that's a pretty big chunk. But there's a lot of things in development. I know. I don't know if you can say tell us, but like what's beyond all this? What's the what's the uh, the very big end piece? Yeah, I think I think the vision for us is, you know, not just to be, um, you know, the the layer that benefits the most from bringing all these games on. I think when we can show that we can enable large enterprise businesses within gaming and other verticals, that's going to be really cool, right? So I think an example of that is what we're doing with Merit Circle with Beam, right? They're right. building their own version of like a Steam, like a launcher for Web3 games. They have a massive audience. They have a token that supports that. And they have kind of the shared infrastructure across all that, right? And so that's really kind of a one plus one equals three for us where we can work with, you know, up and coming mid-core AAA game studios that can also publish more games. I think, you know, the, the yeah. opportunity to enable platforms is one that, like, very few chains can do. And I think we're the front runner in that. So, you know, as I think a lot of these games and studios get closer to launching, right, where they are in their like life cycle, they realize more and more that the tech and the partnership and who you're working with really matters. And that's where you'll start to see, you know, some big names hopefully come to Avalanche very soon. So, you know, I'm just excited uh, if you think about kind of the larger scale um, and then our ability to also like, build out this ecosystem, build out like true marketing and user acquisition. That's where the team's really been heads down. And it's it's a much 
less sexy part of building out an ecosystem or doing your job, right? But I think in this, we were just talking about like this bear market that lasted for quite a while, it felt like. Um, it was a good opportunity for us to really spend time and go deep with our teams who were, you know, still here and building, as well as building out a lot of this plumbing and stuff that you don't normally think about when you're like, oh, let's go, let's go bring some games to the ecosystem. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I'll just say like uh, a friend of mine, uh, Ken from from Meld, he said, you know what the great thing about the bear market is? He goes, there's not so much noise. We can put our head down. We can actually make things work and we don't have to deal with all the nonsense that's going on. So I got to tell you, Ed, I think you 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 and Avalanche made full use of your time. And thanks for answering all those questions. That was fantastic. Everybody, if uh, there's links in the description for everything that we just talked about, you can take a look at Avalanche, the subnet, Beam, and the different games that are out there. But Ed, thanks so much for stopping by. We'll have you back when uh, new things come about. Yeah, I'm happy to come back anytime. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was it. So, Ed, I got to say thanks uh, so much, first of all, for being concise and uh, well, about your answers that you were giving and then just give us some uh, some great information. So, again, I appreciate uh, my man Ed coming on and we'll have him back on again when uh, different things happen. Now, before we get to the Q&A, there's a couple of things I have to mention. First of all, we talked a lot about a woo-woo stuff and we got very bullish. So you have to understand, of course, I am bullish but I'm also biased, right? And I'm biased, as you can see right here. Uh, I own AVAX. I own Avalanche. I own a heck of a lot more Bitcoin. That's why I talk about Bitcoin all the time. But I own a lot of stuff. Ethereum, Solana, Near, Cardano, Avalanche, Link, Stacks, Arbitrum, Mutable, Injectable, Cosmos, Polygon, and other like Ronin and stuff that I see in the, in the comment section. I own a lot of stuff that's out there. So if you think like, ah, oh, Rob is just doing this out of the goodness of his heart. No, it's because Rob is biased. That's really what it comes down to. And then as, as a reminder, it's great to be, to be bullish, but don't be stupid. There's always something around the corner that can take your money from you. There's always something that you have to be aware of when you're investing. And there's always opportunities to lose. And this is a, a prime example. And we'll get a Q&A. But uh, the Solana Saga phone, it just lost 750 Solana. Now, this is only for, this is like $60,000 in its treasury, but there was a Solana Saga DAO, like an unofficial DAO on Discord. And this is the thing that happens when you don't do the right things. So here's what, here's what we got. So this Solana, the money or the Solana itself was supposed to be securely held in a multi-sig wallet, which multiple or multiple parties would need to approve any transfer, but no one ever activated that security feature meaning it only took one of 12 signers to move the funds. What this is, is when you have a multi-sig wallet, it's as many people as you can to do a transaction, to transfer it to a centralized exchange or to transfer another wallet. You need all the actual uh, signers to actually go in there and go, okay, I approve this. We can all do this. If you do not make that actually happen, again, this is a multi-sig wallet. Not everybody has these. Then you can't move the funds and they're stuck there, which is very safe. And in this situation, it didn't happen. On Wednesday, the group, the Saga DAO, sent 750 in sold tokens to an address controlled by one of its pseudonymous, pseudonymous, geez, I suck at this, founders, ZK Red Devil, that was supposed to have the security in place. ZK Red Devil claimed they were the target of a remote hack. And of course, that could be true. But another of the uh, DAO's uh, synonymous founders, goes by Ashen, pushed back on the narrative Wednesday, accusing this guy of pulling the heist himself. Fan club started as a Discord server where owners of uh, Solana's exclusive Saga phone congregated to chat about their phone's perks from free airdrops to NFTs. And that's like great. You do you you do that. You get together. You're like, this is fun. We're just talking. And then they get ambitious and they do a DAO, which is nothing wrong with that. And they secured 700 Soul by selling a pre-launch S coin it had received on a Lark. So a couple lessons here. First of all, easy come, easy go. And uh, second of all, it's not how much you not, it's not how much you you make, it's how much you keep. So just remember that as we roll into the bull market. And that's it for today. So look, everybody, if you like today's video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing. Everything we talk about is time sensitive.